In this short lecture from Chapter 2 in your textbook, I'm going to talk to a little bit about the benefits of mediated communication. So one of the, one of the most important things, one of the most uh, significant benefits uh, of mediated communication is that it affords us all more relational opportunities than we previously had. A good example of this would be, of course, be online dating. So in a recent study of 19,000 people, over one-third of the respondents met their boyfriend or girlfriend online. And we, we find now that relationships that started online have more staying power and a higher degree of satisfaction than those that start face-to-face. -face. So you might remember that I told you in, in a different short video that uh, when I was in, in college, we used to make fun of people who met online. Well, little did we know. That, that, in fact, their relationships uh, were probably more satisfying and lasted longer than, than many of the relationships that we started uh, in, in, in the traditional face-to-face -face manner. We also see that social media uh, has helped spawn uh, uh, a whole bunch of, of non-romantic relationships as well. So we see people uh, routinely posting in forums, discussion boards, uh, that, that feel as if they're part of uh, what's an, become an online community. So they make contacts and, and in some instances really close friends through online communication. Um, they, they, they recognize one another, sorry that's a typo, and, and oftentimes offer a form of social support to one another. So this can be really beneficial. Um, my mother, for example, in her later years, uh, developed Parkinson's disease and, and routinely uh, engaged with other people on Parkinson's support groups online and message boards that really helped uh, create a kind of uh, emotional and, and social connection with other people who were suffering the, from the disease and they were able to offer support to one another. So what we see, generally speaking, is that there are opportunities to, to initiate relationships beyond those that were available in previous generations. So we find that in many cases, people who, who are shy uh, are more willing, uh, probably because of disinhibition, right, and, and the, the lean, asynchronous nature of, of much mediated messaging, they're, 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 they're able to build, shy people are able to build uh, relationships online that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do face to face. So, so this has really been a boon to, sh to, to shy people and, and, and help them uh, establish relationships that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. We also see that mediated relationships can help to alleviate lonely feelings. Now, now, many of you have probably experienced this firsthand during the pandemic, where you're inside since March and you can't really go out and do any of the things you used to do. It's really refreshing to be able to get online and communicate with other people via Zoom or FaceTime or Skype or, or even on a message board or on a forum and feel that kind of interpersonal link with other people again, right? So, so again, it helps alleviate lonely feelings. We also see that, that digital communication helps create relationship building opportunities for people with disabilities. Again, like my mother, who was, who was really kind of limited by her disease and unable to, to, to travel to other people's houses and, and so on with ease. So uh, often, not only does it facilitate our ability to, to initiate these kinds of relationships, but it also helps us maintain them, right? We, we can keep talking to these people online, and it helps us stay close in circumstances where we might not be able to meet face-to-face. -face. I'm going to skip over this video. You can watch it in your own time if you want. But this just sort of drives home the point that, that it's, uh, digital communication can, can really help uh, elderly and infirm people connect with others. So we find that according to all the studies that we've done, text messaging is the most common means of staying in touch, particularly for people of your generation. We find that teens between 12 and 17 text an average of 60 times per day. And we also find that texts are much more likely to be read than emails. 97% of texts are open as opposed to only 22% of emails, and 90% of all texts are read within the first three minutes of delivery. So that's bad news, right, in, in some respects, because if you text somebody and they don't text you back, there's a 90% chance that they read your message within the first three minutes of you sending it, and they just are ghosting you, right? They're just not replying to you. Indeed, we're reading 97% of our text messages, so if you don't hear back from someone, they're communicating, right? 
They're not communicating in that circumstance really is communicating, and it's not a good message. So remember that the next time you blow off somebody's text message. We find that the asynchronous nature of, of uh, digital media allows people to stay in touch without having to connect in real time. So this can be really good in particular if people live uh, in different time zones, right? So I lived in Hawaii for a while, and if I wanted to get in touch with my family on, on the east coast of, of uh, the United States, it was really hard to do it in real time because we were sleeping, I was sleeping when the, they were awake, and they were asleep when I was awake, and so on, right? So, um, you know, emailing back and forth, texting back and forth, was a really good way to stay in touch. And of course now, this, this was sort of pre-Facebook, but now with Facebook, this is a way that people stay in touch all the time, right? Uh, through Facebook. Indeed, I know that, that most of you probably are only on Facebook to connect with your relatives, right? Facebook is kind of an old person's gig. Um, it's, it's, it's the official medium of everybody over 50 years old. And uh, I realize it's probably not your favorite, but again, if you're on there, I bet you you're on there to help you communicate with an aunt or your parents or your grandparents or someone older who is on there. Now, there are some unspoken rules, right? There, there are a series of what we call pragmatic rules or unspoken rules that, that surround Facebook, right? Um, we know that you should expect a response if you're posting on someone else's profile. Uh, you really shouldn't say anything disrespectful about another person on Facebook. You should think about how a post can negatively impact a person's relationship, right? Um, I know, for example, that uh, when I first got married, I, I, I had uh, women friends that would post on, on my Facebook, right? And my wife was, who's this, right? And, uh, you know, after 20 years of marriage, she's chilled on that. But, uh, I, I mean, you know, an ex-girlfriend posting on your Facebook can be, can be problematic, right? Um, if someone deletes your post, we know that you shouldn't repost it because it means that they were embarrassed by it or they, they don't want it there for some, some reason. Uh, and, and generally speaking, people that we communicate with inside of Facebook, we also communicate with outside of Facebook, right? Which is a weird thing about Facebook because it doesn't really work that way with something like Instagram, which of course is also owned by Facebook, right? But I have tons of followers on Instagram that I've never met or exchanged messages with ever, right? Um, so Facebook is, is a little different in this respect. So we know that, that one of the things that mediated channels, that digital communication is good for, is maintaining long-distance relationships. And this is something that maybe some of you are experiencing right now. We know that 25 to 50 percent of college students are currently involved in long-distance relationships, so that's a quarter to half of you. Beyond that, we know that there are at least 3 million Americans, roughly 1 percent, who live apart from their spouses. And, and these folks use things like FaceTime and Skype uh, and, and generally have less contact with each other. I mean, they don't see each other every day in, in, in the same sort of scenarios that you do if you live at home, but they report that the interaction that they do have is of higher quality. It means more when they're able to interact. So interaction over social media can be more effective than face-to-face. -face. And, and the reason why, of course, is because Again, you're disinhibited to a certain extent, and because in these situations where, where if you're living apart from your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, the little time that you get to spend together is more valuable than, than, than much of the time you spend together just living with each other on a daily basis. We also find that social media provides an alternative source of support for personal problems. Uh, we know that... Uh, for example, uh, people with dependency issues, alcohol or drug dependency issues, report social media, uh, Facebook in particular, uh, being, being a great source of support with things like uh, AA pages and um, Narcotics Anonymous pages and things like this, right? Uh, and we also know that 20% of internet users have gone online to find other people with similar problems, right? So. Oftentimes people with uh, things like depression will go online and seek out other people with similar problems. Uh, we know that, that folks go online uh, that, that suffer from heart ailments or, or diseases like Parkinson's, again, like my mother. And, and they're able to find support in the communities that exist uh, that, that sort of surround these, these health issues. All right, so next time we'll talk about drawbacks of mediated communication, right? We, we talked about all the pluses just now, all the advantages, and next time we'll talk about the drawbacks. But that's it for right now, and thanks for checking out this video.